Hi, everybody, and welcome to EuroVA 2021. We are the chairs of this uh, workshop. Uh, I am Katarina Brodsu from Linköping University and Jürgen Bernard from University of Zurich. Good morning. So we are a few that are organizing the workshop this year. Uh, unfortunately, we could not all meet together and we are pretending to be in Zurich with this wonderful background. Hopefully next year we can uh, do it live. Um, but apart from us co-chairs organizing the EuroVA workshop, we also have our publicity chair and um, webmaster, Mikael Beric, and our steering committee, Jörn Kohlhammer and Daniel Kain. Um, we have uh, the lo a few logistics for today. You probably all have already received this information with your registration. But just a repetition, the sessions will be streamed on YouTube. The questions and discussion part is going to take place on YouTube and Discord. So you place your questions in the chat and uh, the technicians, student volunteers will be uh, relaying these questions to the session chairs who will be posting them to the authors, to the presenters. And while not in a session, we can continue the discussion uh, on uh, papers, future work, etc., on Discord and Topia. Um, so, an over, a little overview of our day today. We're going to start now with uh, opening session and award ceremony. Uh, we will then uh, the day will then follow three paper sessions: um, one or two before lunch, one after lunch. We will uh, at the end have our keynote last today, since um, Maria Mari comes from uh, US. And we will close down with some um, closing comments and summarizing the day. Before we get started, we would like to um, give a great thanks to the previous uh, year's co-chair for 2019 and 2020, Chaga Turkai who was an excellent collaborator and has done a wonderful job uh, in organizing the workshop the previous two years. So thank you very much, Chagatai, <laughs> for all the work that you have done for the workshop. Yeah, that's a perfect starter for me. Uh, I'm taking over now. Thanks, Katarina. Um, hello uh, to everyone from my side. Good morning or good night, wherever you live. Um, welcome to Eurovia 2021. And yeah, thanks, Chathai. That was absolutely great what you did the last two years. And I will try to replace you as good as I can. Happy to step in your steps. I would like to continue with uh, the papers and the paper process that we had uh, yeah, uh, before Eurovia uh, regarding submission and reviewing process. Um, you may accept, you may um, yeah, assume that our topics have been around visual analytics, so the visual and interactive and analytical methods of VA, but also feedback loops uh, with a tiny, tiny notion on COVID this year. Uh, we had our standard four plus one pages short paper format, and in the end, we received 15 submissions. And um, given the large number of IPC members, um, we are very proud of having such a large number of IPC members, actually. We were able to support all authors with four reviews for each. And here we are. This is the IPC of this year. Um, and you see many, many, many very, very popular people from our community and colleagues and friends. And we are very proud to have all of them. In the end, we had to make decisions based on reviewers comments. And um, yeah, these have been discussed. Um, we had five papers which were uh, yeah, in a condition that were so good that we unconditionally accepted them. And five more which we accepted based on a conditionally accept and the revision afterwards. However, uh, we were not able to accept five other ones which had to be rejected. Overall, we have 10 papers and 10 presentations today in summary. 
These papers will be presented in three sessions. Uh, first one is on immersive uh, analytics and interaction. Um, and our session chair is Panagiotis Ritos. In the second session, we will focus on VA applications and workflows. And the session chair will be Gennari Adrienko. And in the third session, we will focus on temporal data and clustering. And uh, the session chair will then be Matai Tokai. In the first session, which is again on immersive analytics and interaction, we have an interesting intersection between VR and AR, knowledge board interaction, immersive 3D visualization, and immersive visual analytics. Um, looking forward to that session, which is actually taking place right after our opening. Second session, VA applications and workflows. You can see on the right, there is a lot going on with interactive visual systems about cyber situational awareness, VA tool coordination, attribute scoring functions, and visual analytics of game data. And finally, in paper session number three, temporal data and clustering. Uh, there is a sort of COVID special by occasion. Uh, we have a focus on temporal similarity search, vector plots and infection clusters. And there is another good news. All papers are open access. You can get them just by opening the Eurographics digital library. And you can see, such as the screenshots on the right details, how you can access these papers. That is actually great news. We would also like to thank all the authors who submitted and finally got in. It is about 30 to 35, I guess. It's about 30 authors. Uh, we have them here in alphabetical order. Um, quite uh, prominent names as well. Just one example, Christian Tominski, who was the great keynote speaker of UOVA last year. Uh, thanks for that once again, Christian, and thanks for submitting this year. There is news from this in this year. Um, thanks to Katarina and Chatai. Uh, since last year, UVA papers are indexed in Scorpus. So this means there is an increased visibility, and this accounts for past and future VA publications accordingly. And you may have asked yourself, what about the special issue from last year? The computer graphics, uh, computers and graphics special issue is actually on the way. And uh, it won't take any longer as far as I uh, heard as an author, but also as an organizer. We are very proud to present Mariah Maya today uh, with her keynote. Um, as already indicated by Katerina, Maria sort of will go to bed now and wake up, let's say, in six or seven hours, and then we will be, she will be able to give the keynote as sort of capstone in our last session, which is also the closing session. And the title of her talk will be, A Tool is Not Enough research contributions through design study. Looking forward to this one. And um, just to be complete, this talk will be moderated by Jörn Kohlhammer, who is one of our steering committee members. We are coming to the best paper award now. I'm happy to do the slide um, navigation, but I'm handing over to Natalia now because we had three wonderful, wonderful persons who did the Best paper what committee activities. Thank you, Natalia, in advance. Handing over to you. Uh, hello. Uh, actually, Chitai was uh, going to present uh, the, the most serious part uh, of the uh, best paper award. Please, Chitai. <laughs> and there is Chitai. Good morning, Chitai. Hello. can in the meantime say that we had uh, we selected three pa paper best paper candidates depending on the review scores and the reviewer comments that we had which we then uh, sent to our best paper committee which we're very glad to have this year and is uh, composed of Natalia Andrienko from uh, Fraunhofer EIS and uh, um, City University of London, uh, Chagatai Turkai from University of Warwick, and Ross Matijewski from Arizona State University. Thank Hopefully you. now we can Thank go over. To 
I hope I hope uh, you can hear me now. Yeah. Okay, that's great. You can't see me for some reason, but you can hear me. Uh, but Natalia is covering the video. I'm doing the the voice, so that's good. <laughs> uh, yeah, as 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 Katerina mentioned, we 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 were given as the best paper committee three candidate papers, uh, and then we got the reviews, uh, and each of us uh, went. At, went ahead and read all the reviews, all the papers, um, and then evaluated them um, independently. And then we exchanged our opinions and, and arguments, and we sort of uh, exchanged our ideas about the papers. Initially, the, there were differences. It wasn't like a, a clear cut. Uh, next slide, please. But this was because it was, they were all, all great papers. They were all good papers. And all were good in various different ways. And the, the agreement was that they are all strong in, in, in different ways. But then we went ahead and do, do lots of discussions, uh, but reaching a decision wasn't that hard. So we finally decided to choose one best paper and one honorable mention uh, through an online discussion. So I'll, it's my honor to announce the, the best paper honorable mention. It's towards the detection and visual analysis of COVID-19 infection clusters by Daria Weile, David Sessler, Sebastian Ginzel, and Jörn Kohlhammer. Uh, next slide, please. So this, this uh, best paper uh, develops a visual analytic system for the reconstruction of missing links uh, within the, the, the contact networks, contact tracing networks, to help detect potential uh, disease pathways. And, and we've all been sort of uh, impressed by by how good an example it is uh, as a as a way of applying visual analytics um, and as a as a way of showing how uh, complex problems could be solved through visual analytics by uh, augmenting computation through domain knowledge. So congratulations to all the authors uh, for this really nice paper. Uh, I'm also sort of uh, clapping my hands uh, just like Natalia, and I hand over to Natalia for for the the best best paper uh, yeah here is the um it is the also the the virtual uh, award certificate congratulations uh, once again natalia yeah and i have the honor to announce the best paper of euro 2021 it's lf pierce Temporal Similarity Search in COVID-19 Data by Jan Burmeister, Jürgen Bergnard, and Jörn Kolhammer. So this paper is very interesting because the authors tackled a very interesting novel problem. You cannot find many works on, on this problem. It's what happens to processes which are uh, uh, sim which develop similarly up until some point in time but then diverge and why they diverge so this is a completely new uh, uh, problem for at least for visual analytics and uh, uh, they um, proposed a very nice uh, approach with, which was composed of uh, uh, visual interactive and computational technique and uh, just instead of uh, uh, repeating uh, or uh, telling what uh, the approach is, I just invite you to the session and to listen to this very nice and very great paper. Uh, I congratulate the authors, my applause, and uh, so they deserved uh, your attention and uh, they deserved the award. Thank you. Good morning from me. My name is Panos Richos, and I will chair the first session titled uh, Immersive Analytics and Interaction. 
Uh, we got three exciting papers for presentation today. Uh, if you have any questions, we encourage you to post those uh, on Discord and Topia. Even uh, during the presentations, they will be uh, passed on to me, and I can then pass them on to your to to uh, to the speakers. Uh, we will start with uh, the first paper. The first paper is titled "Talk to Hand: uh, Knowledge Board Interaction in Augmented Reality as an Analysis with Machine Learning Assistance." And it's by Teresa Hong, uh, Benjamin Watson, Kenneth Thompson, and Paul Davis, and will be presented by Teresa. Hi, welcome to our talk. Uh, my name is Teresa. I will be the presenter today. Um, Dr. Watson is my advisor, and I want to thank Ken and Paul helping us on running the research. We will be talking about Talk to Hands, which is our system about knowledge board interaction in augmented reality using analysis with machine learning assistance. Um, here's the agenda today. In the talk today, I will go through the problem we want to solve, contributions we made to the problem solving, the system we are actually building, and the future work we want to work on. And let's start with the problems we want to solve. So intelligence analysis has become more and more, more and more challenging because how the data grows. You can we imagine um, imagine a zillabyte of the data people collect every day from the cloud platform like AWS or Google Cloud. And machine learning automation can definitely help. But um, however, current machine learning systems still have a tedious interaction. Some of the famous, most famous tools are still code-based and not really intuitive for people who are not um, familiar with programming. And to solve the, the problem, in this project, we are building an interactive augmented reality front-end interface because we believe AR can help on this problem. To help the an analyst communicate with the backend machine learning assistance, so that um, you have a familiar tool that look like both the an analog knowledge board and traditional window style view, to use with the machine learning um, algorithm help without uh, dealing with the tedious coding and distraction during your work. And one of the questions we hear all the time is, why AR? Why do you choose this? Is that just because it's fancy? Um, so here are some of the reasons we think AR can help us solve the problems. So first is the large display. Um, as the office space is really limited nowadays, it, will, it also limits analysis. We usually are limited to a small tabletop with a few, maybe two, four, eight monitors connect to our co computer. Um, but with AR, you have the freedom. Um, you have the whole virtual space inside your room to put, and it fits easily into your, the analyst workspace. This will also make it able to make the large scale an an analysis that can um, say maybe take over your floor space without making you stepping on all the sticky notes or scroll down with your mouse wheel forever. I'm sorry, that's my dog. <laughs> um, and the last thing is security and privacy, which we care about every day. Um, you don't need to hide your sensitive documents anymore when someone passing by, and you don't need to lock it anymore and worry about where you put a keys on because um, now you are the only one seeing the thing in your space and devices like HoloLens, which is what we're using, actually provide authentication method like um, iris scan or you can also use two-factor um, authentication login on that. Then we want to talk about how we contrib contribute to this question. So our contribution is pretty straightforward. Um, we make it easier for the analyst to use knowledge board by using AR to overlay the virtual knowledge board onto their existing workplaces. And um, 
we use the knowledge board to simplify the interaction with the machine learning assistant without disrupting the analysis progress process. <laughs> okay, and let's talk about the system. Um, here is a diagram come from our short paper. If you haven't read from that, you can, you will see this there. there. And um, we'll briefly go through each steps and how they act in our system. First, we import the documents into the system. Here, um, we make a few assumptions after talking to uh, the intelligent uh, and not analyst um, that the user will have their preferred search engine and they will explore the search result into a role-based table-like CSV-ish data, including some of the general information crossing um, those search engine, um, which is like uh, data, sorry, <laughs> date, relevancy, content, title, author, location, etc. Once you get a data import into the system, it will visualize it to an interactable list, which we call a triage queue. Um, this is the step I um, mean to have the user quickly go through a list to label a small group of the documents so that the machine learning algorithm can start making some suggestions. And we are going to show you how it looks like. So here's a screenshot and here's a video how it actually looked like in the interactive moving state. And um, the triage queue is designed to primarily separate relevant and irrelevant data quickly. Um, here we prioritize the ease of use, so we introduce a pie menu like, uh, which I'm dragging right now, like categorization method. So we expect that after a few uses, the user can familiar with themselves uh, with the system and almost do the labeling without looking at UI um, that it will actually improve their efficiency and here are the toolbar you can actually like a kind of enable and disable all the different views you have then we talk about knowledge board uh, which more likely look like analog one um, once there are enough information from the triage queue the knowledge board will visualize the categorization and allow the user to spatially arrange each document as they will more likely do in an analog knowledge board itself. And here's a video and the screenshot. The, uh, the knowledge board is so big that I can't really show it in one, one shot. So you can see me moving around and that's my hand. Um, and this, those are the virtual cursor. Um, you can drag and drag those cards and you'll snap into a place to help you arrange it. So you feel like you have the freedom, but you also have um, won't really go too for, too out of control in the in the virtual knowledge board. And knowledge board helps analysis uh, analysts take relevant data items and organize spatially into related groups. And here you can see um, the screenshot I have some putting on my real desktop and and I can move everything around just as I like. And here's a, a detailed view. Um, in case they want to examine the data carefully, since the card itself only shows the first line or limited data, um, you can always tap into the detail. And then we also provide the input to make annotations or add in tag and those input can also can either be made from the virtual keyboard or the you can connect the Bluetooth keyboard to the um, to the AR headset. And we want to talk about how the recommender actually works. So if the user requests, excuse me, um, machine learning assistant will kick in and provide suggestions to some of the unsolved part if you're comfortable with. And how it works is behind the scene, the recommender is learning from how the user is grouping things spatially on the knowledge board. And the recommender will send back the prediction with the confidence and visualize it on the knowledge board by color coding and adjusting different brightness level or just make it visually um, clear that this, this thing is from the recommender, not from the user themselves. And the recommendation will appear as a card on the periphery 
of the group or the clauses in empty space. However, the user can definitely choose to ignore the current recommendation if they feel like it's not helpful at all. And when they feel to, they can always request for a new round of recommendation based on the current state after they have moved in nothing they like. And here is a real implementation for the system architecture. Um, here I want to briefly talk about how just uh, um, is implemented. Uh, when the user performs the interaction with the ARUI by input like gesture, mouses, things like that, um, we send the interaction through the interconnect, which is an API call built on Flash server to the recommender. Um, the, the API call will be sent in the JSON format and the recommender is currently using a mix of scikit-learn library and duck to bed and is built on Python. Once the machine learning implementation return the prediction and the confidence value of its prediction, we again will send the result back through the API and visualize the result to the user and so that the user can make use of the prediction result. Then we want to talk about the future works. Um, first, we definitely want to complete a user experiment, which we will talk. Uh, we will add more detail in the few uh, in the next few slides. Sorry, next slide. And we also want to add a tighter integration with physical workspace, because we want to take advantage advantage of the AR um, that they can clearly see the real world and the virtual world at the same time. We want to. Um, allow the user, for example, let them drag thing, drag and drop thing from their desktop to the AR world, and then drag it, and then maybe bring things back from AR to the desktop. That way, it will be more familiar with the user, and then it will be easier for them to adapt to the system. Um, we also want to try more sophisticated machine learning algorithm, and thanks to the API design, we have the back end and front end loosely coupled, and so that make the machine learning algorithm switching of the machine learning algorithm much easier than um, the other design. We also definitely want to allow non-textual data, like uh, which is pretty common in the intelligence analysis. Those are things like image, table, geospatial information like ArcGIS uh, files will be part of our consideration. So user experiment. Uh, we definitely want to compare the traditional desktop-based application on large display, multiple large displays versus our AR version. And uh, we plan to run the comparative usability studies with intelligence analysts. Um, that said, we will be using a pretty um, popular one from the vast challenges, which will also be um, open to the public. Um, tasks, we will focus on small and analyst tasks since we want their feedback. Now, um, um, <laughs> sorry. And uh, for example, identify actors here for the timelines and how you, and we want to more focus on how they feel like on um, performing the task instead of the task accuracy itself. Uh, some measures, we want them to talk aloud so we know how they actually feel when they are working on the working on the system. And we want to obtain their insight and pain points about this new AR system. Thank you for the, um, join us with the talk. Um, here's the slides. If you have any questions, feel free to email me or my advisor. And if you have any questions, please bring on. And thank you so much. Thank you, Teresa, for uh, an excellent uh, presentation. Uh, we have a couple of uh, questions from uh, the audience. I have a couple of questions myself. There is one question that says that uh, from uh, Natalia, uh, can spatial um, arrangements be not um, only grouping, but also ordering? 
Hey, thank you for a question. Uh, oh, can you can you hear me? Yes. Okay, cool. Um, so can spatial arrangement be not only grouping, but also ordering? Yes. So uh, more likely we detect the spatial arrangement. Uh, grouping is just one of the way that um, we Show the uh, we show the categorization and the prediction, but uh, when we are feeding the user feedback from the um, from the UI, we are definitely taking into how they spatially order, saying um, um, saying there's a plan, and then how you put something close to the other thing as a vector into the um, into the recommender, say in the machine learning system. So yes, that is definitely one of the things we take in into the um, the recommender. Okay, so and I've got a question which sort of relates to that. You highlighted the, the privacy aspect of Step to Hands, but mm -hmm. is it possible to share the knowledge boards, the arrangement of the knowledge boards, so save them, say in a configuration file and pass them on to, uh, to colleagues because, um, Okay, you have a private view through the, the AR, but it would be quite cool to actually share that, uh, that view when you want to, to do a bit of a collaborative um, analysis. Yes, uh, that was actually one of the things we were talking about um, with our uh, research, the industrial research groups. Uh, so first of all, uh, we talk about that because we always think collaborative is a good thing, right? And then uh, <laughs> so the, the, whoever doing this with us in the uh, in the in analyst uh, industry say, uh, sometimes they want to be left alone. But yes, uh, so that's one of our future goal depends on how people uh, react to our system, but we do. We are aware that uh, saying Hololens well mix mix reality generally have a good um, good thing in thing in mind like uh, for the collaborative use. So uh, they do have a feature like uh, having the share spatial anchor and then having the ability to share it with the same thing. So. Um, not talking about how how like a private how we can do this with the privacy because that might be a little deeper on the cybersecurity part. It is possible to do a collaborative thing on AR and VR. Well, mixing reality in this case. Okay, and is there have you thought about using also VR as well, um, depending on the context, say, of the user? Because some people may want to work in private. And or they want to. Um, I know there's quite a lot of people in the community who use special software to cut off uh, Facebook and uh, all the distractions. So somebody could say, you know, working in VR can be uh, not necessarily a bad idea in certain situations. Have you thought of potentially of, of doing that? It would be fairly easy, I suppose. Yeah. So um, talking about that, uh, that will be a little bit implementation problem in this case. So how? I implement that is on Unity right now, which is a cross-platform. Well, more likely it was originally a game engine, right? And one of the, the benefit of it is like, it's totally cross-platform that it was also supported by most of the major VR, like the Oculus, um, Oculus, Oculus Quest, which was one of the most popular VR headset and most of people have one, including me, I love it. And <laughs> so, uh, there is some work need to be done for, for migrating uh, the system from AR to VR just because Microsoft HoloLens have, a, uh, we are currently using MRTK, which was the open source development kit uh, maintained by Microsoft. But I believe their system actually can also support Oculus Quest or other VR headset as well, since they are aiming for the, I think it's called Open XR, which is like a general platform using for all of the AR and VR headset. So there, it is possible, I'll say, but there, uh, we just don't know yet about how much effort we need to put um, on just like migrating or just make the system itself cross-platform supported. Okay. 
it should be fun. <laughs> yeah. And one final uh, question. Um, that's my question. I think uh, you said that you're going to have a user uh, user based evaluation. So that's that's your plan. Have you mm -hmm. done any formal testing? My, my my question is whether you've actually observed any distinct patterns on how people that make uh, arrangements and whether if you use it with some domain experts, whether they, to what extent do they mimic the things that they do in the physical world uh, or they come up with new ways to arrange the information? We wasn't able to uh, hit that step. Yeah, we are working on that just because how the rules and everything around COVID is changing nowadays, the process, the IRB thing just changed daily, every single day. Like we keep emailing them and they're like, ah, oh, something changed today. But yeah, we are uh, we are working on that and um, we are trying to figure out how, how we can like uh, book the people and how we can work with them to, to have like more about like first-handed feedback about it. Yeah, yeah, I suppose under normal circumstances, it would be interesting to see whether the people do the same things as, as they do in the physical world. But that being said, you have the actual challenge of dealing with, with the, the, the pandemic and the practicalities that that brings. Okay, excellent. Yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Teresa, for answering our questions. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, it was really nice to meet you. So we will go to our next, uh, uh, next paper now. Mm -hmm. um, the next... Hold. Hello, my name is Britta Pester. I'm a member of the Chair of Computer Graphics and Visualization of the Technical University in Dresden. And I would like to introduce our new approach for an immersive 3D visualization of multimodal brain connectivity. Here's a brief overview of my talk. I will start with the motivation. So what are the current problems in visualizing brain connectivity? Then I will show some related work and especially also um, in other fields of research. And then we come to the core point, namely our concept what's the layout and what are the opportunities for the user for interaction and then our evaluation strategy and our results and finally I'm really looking forward to discuss with you what can we conclude from our results and what can we not conclude. So the basic question was how is the brain connected and how can we illustrate this? Here it is important to emphasize we are talking about connectivity, not activity, because just if two areas are active at the same time, that does not mean that they are connected. And we are talking about functional connectivity, not structural, because structural means rather like physically connected, for example, fibers in the brain that connect two areas. And we use mathematical models to approximate the recorded data and to derive the direct networks from that. The problem is that the output is very high dimensional. Here in this example, I have tried to illustrate a three-dimensional tensor with time frequency and directed node in space. Uh, but in fact, we have more modes. In our case, we have several subjects and we have several groups. And so the question is, how can that be intuitively and interactively be visualized and this problem has not been solved yet. 
so we had a look at the related work also in other fields of research and here in this case uh, we, I show some visualizations of migration flow because in the end these are also directed weighted networks and on the left hand side for example you see the migration flow within the US and the sources are color coded by blue and the things are color coded by red and in the middle the edges fade and in the middle illustration this is some kind of adjacency matrix uh, called Maptrix, which shows New Zealand one New Zealand as the outflow, one New Zealand as the inflow and in the adjacency matrix the strength of um, migration is again color coded and on the right hand side you see the migration flow from eastern US to Europe and in the middle of this figure the temporal evolution is also color coded so every illustration has its advantages and disadvantages but nothing is perfect and the same thing is true for the illustration of brain networks here I have some examples uh, on the left hand side you see a huge adjacency matrix where every electrode is shown and every electrode combination has also X and Y axis with time and frequency it this shows a lot of details but it is not intuitive at all and on the middle figure there this is some more intuitive but on the other hand it is pre-processed by independent component analysis so you see the network between the derived components and not by the original data and on the right hand side this is some kind of clustering based on the time series itself and the temporal evolution of the clusters can be seen where the electrodes switch and where not but also here every illustration had, has its advantage and disadvantages and now we come to the point where we come to the virtual reality part so Young and colleagues propose the migration flow again as a 3D model and they added the height as a filter attribute but it's hard to um, perceive it in a 2D model so they proposed to use an immersive environment to um, stretch and shift the planes of the globe and this was the basic idea why we said okay the head can be seen as a globe why don't we use this idea too and this is um, the idea we had we have the head with the nose and have the origin and destination head and the time pick layer and the heat map panel I will explain that in the following here we have the VR main view that means we have a source head and a sink net head pardon and a time pick layer so the user can shift the time pick layer and 
this encodes the time from left to right and the corresponding map of the network is shown above the time pick layer. And the user can also select a source or a sync node. Here in this example it's a source node. So if you have any um, hypothesis about your experiment then you can say okay the frontal areas are more interesting than the occipital uh, areas. And furthermore there is this heat map panel where you can see the details and you can choose a frequency band of um, interactions that means um, many experiments like um, in our case it was a visual um, task we were more interested in the occipital areas so you can choose um, the occipital areas and uh, then for the visual stimulus the alpha frequency range that means 8 to 12 hertz um, and you can also choose a threshold for the drawn connections in space because as you see it's a fully connected network and um, you as you can see you can see nothing <laughs> and you can also choose a node combination note combination for detailed time frequency map. So here in this case it was uh, electrode 01 and 0z and you can really see the onset of the visual trigger at the alphabet. Now we come to the evaluation. We had six participants in two groups. The first group were three PhD students in the field of neuropsychology, so they knew about EEG data, but they did not knew anything about yeah, handling VR. <laughs> and on the other hand, we have three participants of computer science in the field of computer sciences, so they knew how to handle the VR, but they did not know anything about EEG data. And there were a number of tasks and they covered uh, tasks of interaction, so let's say um, shifting the time pick layer or a spatial recognition where the question was, yeah, okay, can you um, say where is the sink and where is the source of this edge and then um, playing with the heat map panel so uh, selecting a frequency of interest or something like that and we were using the thinking aloud method so they always had to talk about what they are experiencing right now. And then they had a final questionnaire and this included the system usability score and um, here we have results of the system usability score. We had for these six participants we had a mean value of 74.6 which is very good because in a meta study uh, there has been a mean value of 68% and so for these six people this is a good result and um, in the free text um, they 
agreed or strongly agreed with liking the overall experience. And what is also very interesting is that they preferred the anatomical arranged views, views um, and not the heat map panel, but they nevertheless, they think this is, benef is, is a beneficial complement. Now we come to the discussion together. What we can say that in general, all participants like the application. And um, the neuroscientists that they could imagine that they use the application in a professional context especially then when no hypothesis is given. But what has to be done? Uh, we only had six participants. This is just a proof of concept, not more, but not less. And um, then it would be interesting to compare the VR application um, with a desktop application whether the VR provides a benefit. And um, up to now, we only have used one EEG data set. We have a whole lot of more data sets. It would be interesting how we can um, implement a combination of several data sets. And then Finally, the final step would be a clinical application. So what I didn't uh, say up to now is that the data set is from a study with uh, children suffering from dyslexia versus um, children without dyslexia. So maybe our application can help to find out where differences in the networks appear. So thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you, Brida, for an excellent presentation. It's quite a different use case that uh, we have been uh, used to, to seeing. Uh, it's quite a quite a refreshing way to, to see things. Uh, we have a question from uh, Sivam. Uh, are you using any method to order the nodes in matrix representation? Yeah, uh, this is quite basic. So in the matrix representation, it's um, like you start with the frontal electrodes and go back to the to the um, behind of the brain. And this is why you also have these off diagonals in the matrix view, because these are the neighbor, neighbored electrodes. Okay, and there's a, a continuation in that question and I also have a question relating to that. Uh, also it would be interesting to build, implement an ordering technique that takes into account the different attribute uh, layers. Have a comment on that? Yeah, we were, so we also have tried, uh, for example, to make uh, some uh, kind of k-means and order the electrodes in depending uh, on the different clusters we found. But um, so the, our application is some kind of balancing between the user, so the psychologists, the neuroscientists, and they are really used to it that you always have this order. And this makes it very hard for reading the, um, the adjacency matrices. I suppose this, the structure that we see is the same for, for every brain. So could you compare multiple brains, for example, somehow? Yeah, yeah, this is, this is standard brain. So you have the EEG caps, so there, here in this case, it was 28 channels, I think, but there you can go high on 64 or even 128, but they are standard. Okay, so, so everybody knows how to read that. 
Okay, so you could do a comparison. So uh, um, one, I've got a couple, I've got a question myself. Is uh, you mentioned that some of your participants did not have experience in VR. So what was their expectation before they actually did the the, the before they played with it? Because it's quite interesting when you work with the, with other domain experts. What exactly do they expect that VR will do? They were hoping that our abstract data are easier to be read because. If you do not have the anatomical uh, view of it, it's not so easy to extract the main information. And so they were hoping that, with, especially with the interaction, that you can choose a sync or a source node, that you can choose a frequency, um, that you can find some structures that you would not have found if you only look at the adjacency matrices. Okay, yeah, and, um, I suppose, okay, I, I, I do not know much about the brain, but when you, you have the, uh, the time peak layer and we see the two hemispheres there, uh, would it be possible to actually have more different structures there? Is there any, any, any meaning in having different structure, different sort of breakdown of areas? Is there any, any point in that? Because I know that you have half and half. That's okay. We know how that works when it comes to the brain and the two hemispheres. But would it be possible to actually have different mappings there and be able to see something else? Yeah. So what is maybe important to emphasize? So oh, sorry, um, this is not the brain half, but this is always the um, sink and source. So we did not use rough EEG data. So what I did not say in the talk, but wrote in the paper, is that we used partial directed coherence which is a connectivity measure within the brain where you have temporarily varying data and you have the frequency information too. Okay. Okay. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much for your, for, for your answers. It was really an exciting <laughs> presentation, quite, uh, quite different. It's always uh, nice to see, um, you know, new ways of using uh, VR and immersive analytics mm -hmm. and encourage everyone to continue the conversation on, on Discord and, and, and Topia um, and have a chat with you. Thank you very yes. much. Thank you. The last, uh, paper, the last paper for the session uh, is titled Immersive Analytics of Heterogeneous Biological Data and Informed Through Need Finding Interviews. And it's written by Christina Ripken, who will do the presentation as well, Sebastian Task, and Christian Tominski. Welcome to the talk Immersive Analytics of Heterogeneous Biological Data Informed Through Need Finding Interviews. My name is Christina Ripken. This work is part of a bigger project called Avatars. In that project, different biologists are working together, generating a large amount of complex biological data. To analyze this large amount of biology that is highly inter interdependent, we utilize immersive analytic technologies um, to help biologists. We utilize need finding interviews that are inspired by design thinking to identify such a use case. So the first contribution of this work are insights from need finding interviews with biological experts. The second contribution is the immersive analytics prototype. Based on the needs we identified, we developed um, a first immersive analytics solution to analyze large and heterogeneous biological data. In the first part of this talk, I introduced the need finding strategy and in the second, the prototype itself. Design thinking is a popular method to develop solutions in a user-centered manner. Need finding is one small part of it that we utilized to identify the needs of our, our biologists. At the core of this me method is to differentiate clearly between the user's problems and potential solutions of the user. The idea of that approach is that nothing will motivate a potential user more 
to actually use a solution than the real-world problems he's facing today. When conducting need-finding interviews, it's important to mainly ask open questions. Directed questions will potentially lead the interviewee somewhere and we want him to speak freely, to feel comfortable and to also express thoughts that he might have not in a more formal situation. The task of the design thinker is to probe into topics that appear to become challenging and ask again and again until the core, the real core of the problem is understood. We interviewed 12 biologists that are involved in crop plant research. Apart from one, all of them were either holding a PhD or were enrolled in a PhD program. Each of the biologists had a different research focus. For instance, molecular breeding or computational biology. All of the biologists are integrated in the overarching research project Avatars. So we conducted the interviews in the way that we provided information in, in advance and informed the biologists that we want to learn about their visualization practices and about the problems they are facing. Then we drove to their working places, met them in person. Um, but due to the pandemic, we couldn't meet all of the participants. During the interview, we encouraged the participants to lead the conversation, while we only made sure that the key points were covered. Afterwards, we summarized the interview in four parts. So the first part of the documentation describes the person and its research in a way that the user can fully relate to it and understand the research. The second part explains what aspects of the visual analysis process are running well. And the third part, the pains, describes the ongoing challenges and um, yeah, the problems. And the fourth part, the jobs to be done, summarizes and describes in a condensed way what it's desired and what insights we can summarize from that interview. So from the interviews, we were very happy that we could um, derive many needs and um, thus we were lucky to be able to select certain needs that we thought would be beneficial to realize in an immersive analytic solution. The criteria we therefore used were, one, um, we considered needs more relevant when they were mentioned by many people. And second, its characteristic regarded um, large data, interdependent data, and um, volumetric data. So before describing the insights and the needs we derived from the interviews, I want to show JBrowse. JBrowse is a genome browser. Most of or many of the biologists we talk to are working with. One major task that is conducted with a genome browser is to identify which parts of the genome or which base pairs predict a phenotypic trait. So what do we see here? At the top, the colored little points, that is the reference genome, while every color displays uh, or visualizes a base pair, um, adenine, guanine, cytosine, and thymine, or thymine. And below, in each row, um, a genome track is displayed. On the left side, you see um, white little IDs that indicates that that is one genome track. So the information that um, a biologist here can gain is when you, for instance, look at the fourth genome track from the top, there are little um, colored columns in one genome track. And that means that in this position of the genome track, this genome track has a different base pair than the reference genome. 
So when the this genome track, for instance, has um, a certain resistance that the um, other genome tracks that don't carry this change do not have the resistance, this could be an indicator that this base pair and this mutation in this position is responsible for the expression of a phenotypic trait. Many of the needs we picked are directly related to the use of genome browsers. As shown in the previous slides, each genome track is identified with an ID. It's current practice that the biologist pick an ID and look up its phenotypic traits in another tool. This is time consuming and this is why the bio biologists desire that they can visualize the phenotypic traits right in the genome browser. Thus, they desire to link different data sets and to get details on demand. Another need results from the fact that the relevant genes or mutations in the genome can potentially be anywhere in the genome. Thus, the search for the very relevant regions can be very time-consuming for the researchers. And um, this is why they want to have solutions to reduce the searching time. Since we are aiming to utilize the large virtual space, we set up an overview over the genome data in our immersive analytics solution. When the researchers want to identify for one phenotypic trait which gene determines the expression of the phenotypic trait, such genes are distributed across the whole genome. The researchers are searching for specific characteristics within the genome alongside the relevant genome regions. To identify genome regions of interest, the researchers would benefit from a tool that can compare the relevant genome regions directly. Thus, the researchers desire comparison of data subsets. Since the researchers are searching for consistent relations within the genomes according to the phenotypic traits, it is of interest to order the genome tracks according to the phenotypic traits. Within JBrowse, it's supported to drag and drop single genome tracks, but it would be also beneficial if the ordering of the genome tracks would be supported automatically. Thus, a flexible reordering and grouping of data is desired. So the next need is probably not the most interesting need from a visual analytics point of view, but it's very interesting from the design thinking point of view. It is the far most mentioned need and um, also the always very first mentioned need when um, regarding JBrowse and that is that JBrowse has um, very long loading times and that um, the people are simply annoyed waiting for the data to load. That is due to um, the characteristic that it's a web-based tool. I would interpret that a tool that has the same functionality as JBrowse with the one and only difference that it's running faster would support a shift from the whole user base to the new solution. The last need I want to stress because it was found only due to the interview strategy. In plant breeding, the individuals are crossed many times. During the crossing, their genes become reassembled. It's of interest for the biologists to trace one gene, how it was passed across different generations. For this task, there's no proper analy data analysis tool yet. In summary, we identified needs to link different data sets, to show details on demand, to yield an overview over a large amount of data, to compare data subsets, to flexible reorder and group data, and to show data with low latencies. Furthermore, the traceability of the inheritance of genes is of high interest. The IDs N1 to N7 
refer to the needs in the paper. Now I introduce our immersive analytics prototype. In our immersive analytics solution, we want to utilize the large virtual space to show more data in an integrated fashion. Therefore, we set up a basic concept. We project gene data as a color-coded table on a large virtual wall. Furthermore, we can pick a volumetric seed model and show its genome tracks and related transcripts. That fulfills the need to link different data sets. Furthermore, we attach bar sheds with phenotypic attributes to the genome tracks. That fulfills to show details on demand and to link different data sets. As the data in virtual reality becomes very small, we add a focus and context method into the table rows. That fulfills the need to show details on demand. Additionally, we focused to facilitate real-time navigation of the data. That fulfills need for. This picture shows the core visualization of our immersive analytics genome browser. I want to explain the basic concept. On the left-hand side, you see a virtual wall that displays 400 horizontal genome tracks. For each genome track, 60,000 SNPs are shown. Described simply, SNPs are market positions in the genome. White indicates that for that SNP on that genome track, the reference genome carries the same base pair. The reference genome is visualized in the top. If a position on a genome track is colored, the genome carries another base pair than the reference genome. The colors visualize the four base pairs. On the right-hand side, you see bar charts that visualize the numerical phenotypic traits. Here, the left column shows the oil content for each genome track. You can see that it's easily observable that the individuals in the center have a high oil content while they carry the same base pair in that location as the reference genome. This would indicate that this could be a location in the genome of interest that is responsible for the expression of the phenotypic trait oil content. With a menu, we can attach the data on demand and update the data in real time. Now I demonstrate an exemplary workflow with the immersive analytics solution. The user can scan within seconds the whole data set for relevant anomalies. The user picks an anomaly and the user opens a menu that supports navigation. Supported by the menu, the user aligns bar charts to the genome tracks. Now the user observes if the anomaly is related to the phenotypical trait. It is facilitated to scroll in real time through the genome. In this way, the user can align other genome locations to the phenotype easily. Scrolling is supported by dragging the screen, by pushing a virtual button, or by pushing a joystick on the controller. In the second workflow, the user selects an exemplary tissue of a seed model and aligns related transcripts to each genome track. As the visualization becomes cluttered, we integrate a focus and context method. A canvas at the end of the ray supports the orientation of the user within the dataset. The biological mechanisms differ across the tissue of an organism. The user selects a tissue of interest and tissue-related transcripts become aligned to the genome track. A focus and context method supports orientation within the genome. Scrolling is still facilitated. In initial user testings, in screen sharing sessions, experts commented that they appreciate the much larger overview over the data in comparison to JBrowse. Furthermore, the linking of the different datasets is beneficial. In internal usability testings, users appreciated the navigation. Nevertheless, the picking of small items was challenging and criticized. In summary, we showed that immersive analytics is capable to support the data analysis for large and heterogeneous biological data. It facilitates real-time interaction of 5 million data points. It also links different types of biological data. In future, we want to solve 
more of the mentioned needs and improve the interaction experience with better picking support. Thanks for your attention. Thank you, Christine, for uh, an excellent presentation. We'll start with uh, a comment from uh, Jason Dykes. Uh, there's a really, there is a really interesting tension between uh, deep engagement with people in a complex application domain and lots of uh, listening and uh, a result that looks quite a lot like some of what we and you have done before, trajectory wall. Uh, not a crisis, is the way that we work. It's just interesting. I suppose the whole dynamic with uh, various other domains is quite uh, interesting. Uh, I'm not sure if you have a comment on that or if you want me to repeat it because it's a long, it's a long comment. Uh, yeah, it's a long comment. Um, I'm, I'm not really understanding where it aims. <laughs> well, there is a question that comes from, from Jason as well. Uh, and then I'll ask another question from uh, Silvam. Uh, so uh, Jason, asks, did you use any dynagrams, dynamic dynagrams in the design thinking exercises? Um, actually not yet, no. Okay, so uh, Sivam asks, uh, there is a lot of data being visualized. Have you observed any patterns, inferences from the overview? If not, I wonder how many, uh, how to make the overview more, more valuable? Yes. Um... So yes, um, actually it was very beneficial in comparison to JBrowse that um, it was very good um, to relate the geno uh, genome tracks and the phenome um, data. And it was um, far easier to, yeah, to find these relevant re um, relations. And um, on the other hand, um, since we are visualizing such a large data set, um, it gets cluttered. And um, since we know that the, um, the biologists are searching for um, consistencies between phenotype and genotype. Um, we are aiming to um, optimize um, the process a little by um, making it possible to jump um, to, yeah, to calculate the regions of interest and um, um, support jumping in the genome faster. Yeah. Yes. Okay, so Jason offers a clarification from um, for, for what he said, I suppose it's, it's a, um, a, a question, I suppose. Yeah. How did you get to a trajectory wall? So what was, I assume, what was the design, the, the thinking process to actually get to the trajectory wall? Uh, was it something that was related to the feedback that you got from, uh, uh, from the domain experts? Was it just um, yes. tapping into the, the, the literature? Yeah, um, definitely. So um, at that point, um, we are, um, I, I'm, my mentioned that we are a startup um, and um, we are looking for um, like real world user problems as I stressed in the text. And um, the like a really strongly mentioned problem that many biologists um, had and um, also in different domains where that um, they, they have to scan like these huge data sets and um, they, yeah, um, they spend a lot of time on that and they um, would improve their working routines and um, would have, um, yeah, would benefit strongly if they could um, scan the data sets larger, uh, faster. I suppose that, that relates to a question that I've asked uh, Britta before. Um, and because one of your goals was to increase awareness of immersive analytics to, uh, to biologists, to expert biologists, or at least tell them what it can do. Uh, do you think it's, this has worked? And what was their expectation? I mean, we're talking about the main experts that are not VR people. We often talk to them about VR people. What is their expectation? What do they, what do they assume that VR will do for them? Um, well, I think many are um, very excited about it. Um, and I would say um, that in the testings, it, runs very well so there are not so many um difficulties in um interacting um with the vr but um the the main insight uh, i got um was that it's very individual individual how the user um interacts with it some are very fast some are slower 
So yeah. Yeah. yeah, I think my my question is always whether people have a look into VR or something which is entertaining and not not necessarily useful for for their domain yeah. specific task. Yeah. But uh, mm-hmm. what I often see is that people come up. Maybe the entertainment factor is there at the beginning, but they immediately go into a more utilitarian approach and they see whether this is actually working for for what they're trying to do. And it's because it's right there in your face. Sometimes it's very difficult to bypass the, the fact that sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, and, and all the peculiarities that this brings. And because it's quite a lot of, um, it's a rich inf- um, environment in terms of the information, uh, did any of the participants complain about simulation, simulation sickness effects and things like that? Did they feel? Yeah, amazing? that's um, a good point. Um, yes, definitely. So this is why we integrated four, uh, three different interaction methods. Um, and we found out that by dragging the screen, um, the motion sickness is um, the littlest. Um, but yes, that is a true challenge. Um, that needs to be overcome. Yeah, I suppose that relates also to the focus and context techniques that, that you use. Maybe for some of them, you can uh, call some of the information which are not necessarily uh, useful always or have some kind of a different focus. I've seen that you have this uh, this effect, but still there's quite a lot of information around yeah. maybe uh, try to, to reduce that. And uh, did you consider any any kind of uh, more any value dependent uh, color schemes for the the bar charts because they're quite tiny and yeah, you can see the high peaks but maybe it would be nice to be able to de- de- to discern the whole range of, of values maybe have you considered that um not yet but that's a good um good point thanks okay okay uh, excellent. Uh, I'm not sure we don't have any uh, any other questions. Thank you very much for uh, another excellent uh, presentation. Thank you, Christine. Thanks.